go. We are live. I am here with Alexander McCurse in London, and I am here with Mr. Gonzalo Lira. Say hello, everybody. Well, by the way, we have the cameras off because of bandwidth issues. So anyway, yeah, I'm, say, I'm say hello. Just gonna, uh, I'll just go on real quick. <coughs> hey, I'm, as you guys see, you see me, I hope you can see me. And yeah, I'm going to go off because it eats up bandwidth. I don't know. Yeah. That interrupted the flow of the, if you guys could hear it properly or not. You're good. You're good. You're good. You're yeah. good. You're good. Yeah. So far, yeah. the connection is good. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, <coughs> great. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, I <laughs> we were having a, a, just to background, you know, we were having a really fascinating conversation uh, about the motivation for my, um, my detention. And I want to emphasize that I cannot discuss the details of uh, this investigation that is occurring as I am still in Kharkov and I am mm. subject to the legal authority of the um, various law enforcement officials here. Mm. And so I am not going to discuss in any detail uh, any, of the, um, any of that situation. But um, yeah. And so th that, that's all I have to say. All I want to do really in this conversation is catch up and what the hell happened over the last mm. week? <laughs> mm. where, where should we begin? We, well, like I, uh, like uh, I was uh, telling you, Gonzalo, you were, you were the news this last week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I will begin with an article in the London Times. It's relatively short and it's uh, 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 Ukraine war revitalized Russia can still win. Western intelligence warns, and we are told, this is from the London Times, President Putin could still win the war in Ukraine, which is now expected to last until the end of the year. Well, we, did, we can put the path about the, uh, uh, the, the, the end of the year to one side. And they say the Russian army outnumbers Ukrainian forces in the east three to one. Well, maybe they do, maybe they don't. Could encircle and destroy a, a significant proportion, the officials warned. They said Russia could even launch a new assault on Kiev or deprive the Ukrainian capital of access to the Black Sea in a worst case scenario. And then it says, Western intelligence suggests that Moscow has made tactical adjustments. The main theater of the war in the eastern Donbass is flat, with firm terrain which offers Russian artillery and tanks an advantage compared with the forests north of Kiev. And Putin has appointed an experienced commander to oversee Russia's operation, General Alexander Dvornikov. And there is a real possibility Russia could su surround Ukrainian forces and grind them down over time, which would be enough to, for Putin to claim it as a win. Consolidating control over Donbass and Crimea could be seen as a success. Now, to my mind, that is the London Times. Remember, the London Times is the first British newspaper to publish an article back in March admitting that the primary objective of the Russians was the encirclement and destruction of the Ukrainian army in Donbass. That is an article that now prepares the British leadership for the fact that Ukraine is losing. I, I cannot believe that they're saying, you know, uh, the Russians could win. I wonder. What are they smoking over there? I yeah, mean, yeah. come on. You know? Well, uh, and then the notion the, that this lasts until the end of the year is a little bit laughable well, because, well, you know, the, at, yeah. at the pace we're going, we're eight weeks into this war, approximately, yeah. I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And at this pace, you know, another eight weeks and it, it's it's this is a catastrophe for Ukraine. Yes. Yes. Because the the youth of Ukraine is being thrown away for nothing. They yes. should negotiate yes. a settlement. Uh, uh, and they should you know, understand that the situation has changed radically. They burned too many bridges. They went back on the Minsk Agreement, which, if yes. you all recall, was the reason that this war did not happen in 2015, because it was happening yes. in 2015, and people seem to forget that. And the only yes. reason the Russians called it off was because Angela Merkel, you know, sweet talked Vladimir Putin into the Minsk Agreements. And uh, the, the Russians backed off and didn't yes. follow through on what they were doing in 2015, which was invading and taking over Ukraine. And <clears throat> so now the 
Americans have no incentive and, and, and to negotiate, no belief that the Ukrainians will live up to their word because they, they failed insofar as, as, um, yeah. as the Minsk agreements are concerned. All they can do now, the, the Ukraine, is end this needless loss of life because that's what yeah. it is. It is pointless at this point. And, and, and I am perfectly aware of my situation. But yes. I, I just have to emphasize this, that the needless loss of life, because there is no victory, unfortunately, yeah. and, and it's only going to be misery and, and the loss of life. And it is just it is just a tragedy beyond comprehension. And I lay the blame yeah. at the at the feet of the leadership of the West, because yeah. the leadership of the West in the UK, the EU and the United States government. They are willing to throw away the lives of Ukrainian boys who have their yeah. whole lives ahead of them for nothing, because nothing yeah. can be won at this point. I, yeah. I'm sorry for, for losing my cool, but I, I just have to make that point. You're absolutely right to lose your cool, because I feel exactly the same way, and I completely share your sentiments. I think throwing away oh, lives oh, in this Alexander, way is... Alexander, is... Oh, sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I have to say something... Because yeah. in, in a weird way, this past week has been sort of like a blip. <laughs> it, it's almost like it, it just, a, a, you know, a lost week and I'm yes. back, you know, you know. And so I, I just want to say something and, and um, I, I want, uh, I know that so many people were so concerned and I am reading the comments as we're talking and there's so many kind words. I, I, I uh, thank you. It, it's very moving to know that so many people cared about me. It, it, it truly was. And, and I yes. thank you very, very much. And um, you guys, you boys. I think we've lost you, Gonzalo, but if you can hear us, can, can I say, repeat publicly what I was saying before we started when we were speaking, uh, pr well, privately, which is that you have many, many friends around the world who greatly admire you and hugely respect uh, the and value what you have been doing over the last few weeks. Uh, thank you, thank you, Alexander. And I mm -hmm. want to thank both of you in particular, and uh, and Alex Christoforou, uh, who's always just you yes. guys are aces. And I just want to tell you, the audience, um, your 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 kindness and it, it's just so appreciated. It means the world to me, and I I cannot I can never pay you. I can never repay you your kindness towards me, but I I will certainly carry your kindness forward towards anybody else who needs this kind of support. I want to I want to tell you something else, by the way. Um, before in that really quick uh, stream that I did with uh, Alex, um, you know, just a, a few hours ago. Um, all of my um, YouTube, I, I don't have access to any of my YouTube channels or any of my Telegram channels or any anything of the sort um, or my Twitter feed uh, because my my phone was confiscated and all the passwords have been changed and so I don't have access to it. I do not know if I will get get access to them again or not. It doesn't really matter. I mean, I can just make a new feed and and make a new channel. Um, uh, I have made a new Twitter feed. It's called Gonzalo Lira 1968, uh, and you can find it right now. And I've posted a couple of uh, of missives. And if you, uh, Gonzalo, you know, Gonzalo Lira 1968. Yes, exactly. Gonzalo okay. Lira 1968. I'm going to put it in the in the chat. Gonzalo Lira 1968. Okay, go go on, go on. Yeah, and I just want to emphasize that. Um, I, I, I'm so humbled, okay, it, really, and uh, I just want to tell you that, and um, and I want to tell you that um, I can't repay you, but I can, you know, in that that stupid book, you know, pay it forward, of mm -hmm. trying to help other people who are in similar circumstances. That is what I will most certainly dedicate myself to, in these very trying times, okay. Mm -hmm. And you have you you who are in chat. You have my commitment. Okay, you have my word as a man that that is going to be my uh, my focus. Okay, mm. okay. So 
Um, Alexander, I'm sorry for cutting you off. What were you saying? You, you, you have no uh, uh, reason to apologize, Gonzalo. And please feel absolutely free to cut me off at any time in any program. I do have a tendency sometimes to ramble on. But uh, on the question of uh, young Ukrainian lives being lost to no purpose, I am completely in agreement. Um, you have missed, I think, the drama of Mariupol. Uh, what we have is a situation where um, Ukrainian troops uh, of various descriptions, some of them holding beliefs, I don't, I, I mean, I abhor, but they're young men and women who, you know, deserve to live. They're now all trapped inside the Azov style factory. The whole of the city has been completely um, cleared of Ukrainian troops by the Russian military. The Russians have repeatedly offered these people in Azov style. Uh, uh, the option of surrendering. Now, the Russians claim, and I have to say, I'm sure what they say is true, is that the uh, authorities in Kiev have instructed the people in Azovstal not to surrender. The people in Azovstal have been sending out extremely desperate videos asking to be transferred to a third country. I don't fully understand what that means. But in any event, Putin... Um, um, yesterday made a decision that the factory itself will not be stormed, yeah. but that yeah. it will be placed under permanent blockade. I don't know whether you're yeah, aware of that, right. but that's the specific Yeah, I, uh, Alex told me about it when Alex and yeah. I were talking yeah. privately uh, be before the show, and, uh, and yeah. I, I thought at the time, number one, Putin is absolutely right. There's no reason to, yeah. um, to needlessly lose lives Yes. Uh, by by trying to storm the Azovstal because now it is no yes. longer a military operation; it is a police yes. situation. Yes. You have yes. basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, in in the sense that nothing can be gained. You know, there yes. there is no way that those soldiers in the Azovstal can somehow break out and conquer Mariupol no. again. So no. Mariupol is over, uh, except yes. you know, as the saying goes, it's all over but the shouting, and yes. and these individuals are the shouting. Now, from what I understand. And please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, that number one, the um, what you call it, the the um, uh, there is no water there. There's no fresh water. Yes. yes. Uh, food, because there, there's a there's a saying of the twos. You can you can last two minutes without air, two hours with uh, in 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 freezing water, uh, two days without water, and two weeks without food. Yeah. Now the 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 issue of water is the real issue. You know, food, yes. you can go a long time without water. I myself have done water fasts. The longest I ever did was 13 days of, of no food whatsoever, only only water. It was, uh, you know, just a crazy thing I wanted to try, to try out. But the point is, you can last a long time without yes. food. Water, forget it. You need water. And so, especially in those conditions, high stress, um, it's probably going to be surprisingly hot down there. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that that is going to be the the number one issue for these guys, and yes. not attacking it seems perfectly reasonable. To tell you the truth, it just wait them out. Yes, yes. I have to say, I think that's exactly what's going to happen, and I do personally think that it's highly likely that at some point we will see these people surrendering. Now, there's been uh, uh, you know Russian military um, blaring out through loudspeakers, telling people to give up to give up in Azovstal, and that's, I'm sure, what's happening. Now, there's been lots of movements in Donbass. Yesterday, the Ukrainian defense ministry, the Ukrainian government, in fact, said that 42 villages had been captured by the Russians in, on Thursday, yesterday, 42. And um, the other thing was a couple of days ago, actually, I think it was on the 16th of April, so a, a day after... Um, events you know, after you were arrested. On the 16th of April, the Russian Defense Ministry put Ukrainian losses, what they called irretrievable losses, at 24,000. Now, I've been uncertain what that word irretrievable means, but I've come to the conclusion it means dead and severely wounded. It doesn't yeah. include prisoners. That's what I think. And, I, I, can I, and, and I have to say, if, if so, that gives us an idea of the intensity of operations because the Russians put the number at 15,000 
on the 24th, 25th of March, 14,000 uh, 14, irretrievable losses on the 25th of March. That had risen to, to another, tw uh, and by another 10,000 by the 14th, by the 16th of April. So, uh, you know, a huge, you know, constant numbers of people being killed. Now, these are Russian figures. Ukrainians give completely different numbers. But we are also now getting, and this is from the American media, huge amount of reports from the American media that the U.S. is astonished at the amount of military material Ukraine is losing and that they're finding it impossible to keep up and that Ukraine loses in a day the amount of weapon systems that the U.S. has been delivering, which was intended to, to last it out for a week. So can, go on, can, yeah, no, uh, I, I just want to jump in real quick. Uh, Gonzalo, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, I hear you fine. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, uh, yeah, um, I just want to kind of tell the chat that we were we were talking privately, us three, yeah. and uh, Gonzalo, me, and Alexander, and Gonzalo was like, "Let's." We were talking about the news because Gonzalo yes. wanted to find out what's going on in the world, and then we decided, "Why, why don't we just go live?" Yes. And have this conversation about what's going yes. on in the news, like just catching yes. up, yeah, so we can just kind of catch up with everybody. But uh, I just want to say, Gonzalo, there's a lot of people in the chat um, who are concerned, saying, you know, um, are you okay? Are you going to be able to get out yes. and all of these things? I just want yes. to kind of let everyone know in the chat why we're here talking about, you know, what's going on yes. in the news, because yes. that's what yes. that's what we wanted to do, just kind of catch up yes. on, on everything that uh, that was going on. But um, I just want to let yeah. you know, Gonzalo, a lot of people are in the chat and they're they're asking, you know, are you going to be okay? Can you get out and, and all of this uh just a lot yes. of concern for, for you, Gonzalo. Yes. Yeah, I, I so appreciate it. And um, uh, AP says that I'm a deep fake. That's that hurts my my little AI feelings. By the way, I, I just want to emphasize that you know I try so hard to beat the Turing test, you know, and now you're you're mm -hmm. catching up. Seriously, yeah. um, you know my my situation here in in, in Kharkov is uh, I want to remain. Uh, I see no reason to. Well, I, I mean, it sounds bizarre, but I, I, my reasons for staying have not changed. I want to see this through to the end. Um, and at this time, I cannot legally leave. And as I am here in Ukraine under the uh, legal authority of the, um, uh, of, you know, legitimate law enforcement, I am staying put. And so th there we are. I'm not going to discuss the details of my specific Great. case because, number one, um, I cannot legally, I signed a document um, specifying that I would not discuss my, uh, the investigation that is proceeding, <coughs> investigation where I am being investigated by the legitimate authority um, here in Kharkov. And uh, yeah, and um, yeah, that, that's all I have to say about that. I, I, I don't want to get into the whole yeah, legal yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I yes. don't, and I don't want to say something that will um antagonize anybody here in uh yes. kharkov in as yes. far as the yes. legal situation is concerned yes. I, i'm sorry for yes. using my words so carefully but uh, yes. uh yeah uh, in, so anyway. in, fa in fact in fact in fact can i say as somebody who has experience of these things i think it is better we don't discuss this in public uh, at all, yes, e e e e e even in terms of you know the the you know what the circumstances and uh, that that led up to uh, your arrest because I, I I think we must be extremely careful what we say and I, I think I'm right in saying Gonzalo that you are actually you actually have uh, legal counsel now giving you advice if, am, am I right in thinking thinking that uh, yes um, yeah and um, yeah. you know there are some people in chat who claim that yeah. I'm making it up okay if, if you want to think that although Alex Christoforou, um, he has seen via um, camera uh, some documentation of my arrest, um, and, and 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 so I can you know point to other people yeah. who can confirm yeah uh, the my status. Yes, I, all I, 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 and I should I should ignore them. Sorry, I, I, I think you should ignore them. And I have to say, I think people who uh, um, um, make those kind of claims, well, I leave it to them to reconcile themselves with their conscience because I, yeah. I, I have to say I consider that kind of 
the conduct absolutely outrageous. And I think that at a time like this to make comments like that, but let's let's move on anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, yeah, because I remember one time I did a stream where I was totally thrown by trolls. Okay. And yeah. and you know never feed yeah. the trolls. That's what they want. Okay, so yeah. Yes. So anyway, yeah. um, insofar as the situation in on the ground in 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 Ukraine is uh, concerned, um, I want to ask you: um, Has there been independent confirmation as to what is going on with the Eastern Army? Um, yes. Is is it is it a slow grind, or has there been any kind of breakthrough? Well, it is a slow grind, and and uh, uh, my very clear impression is that that's exactly what the Russians want. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Think, I think that is. I think I think that is the plan. I think that has been the plan all along. There's there's talk about you know, as I said, the Ukrainians yesterday said forty two villages have been captured by the Russians in a single day. The uh, Ukrainians have lost control of a town called Rubizhnoye which has been confirmed. Apparently, they're in the process of losing another town called Popaznaya. I mean, you know, I, 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 I'm not, as I said, the, the expert on these tactical things. But as I said, I, my, my understanding is that it is a slow grind. And that article I read to you from the London Times seems to say the same. I mean, the, the word about, I, I, would, I would repeat it again, there is a real possibility, and this is a quote, from someone, uh, uh, the words real possibility are in quotation marks. Russia could surround Ukrainian forces and grind yeah. them down over time. And the words grind them down over time are again a quote from this um, official. So that's clearly the plan and that's clearly what seems to be happening. By the way, I should say also that this morning there was talk about a U Ukrainian attempt to launch a counteroffensive towards Belgorod, which is of course in Russia. Um, but um, the word again, and this is purely from the Russians, is that this counteroffensive was defeated and that the force that was sent was destroyed. Now, you know, I can't confirm that. This is all Russian information. But, you know, I, I've up to now consistently found the Russians reasonably reliable when they provide information like this. In fact, well, I've never uh, known them not to be. Yeah. Um, the, on, on the uh, uh, Moskva uh, sinking, they never no. confirmed. Did they ever confirm that it had been a missile? Because I personally no. think it was a missile. I, I do not no. believe in coincidences in these circumstances, and and I, it seems out it seems outlandish rather, not outrageous, outlandish to think that right in the middle of the war, when everybody's at their highest alert, a a random electrical fire would break out that essentially incapacitated such an important military asset. Yes. So have they confirmed there that it was a missile, or keeping it to themselves? They're keeping it to themselves, and I, pre I predict that they will do until um, they've got a full report about what happened and a complete explanation. Um, and, and I suspect they, they will keep it to themselves until the war is over, to be honest. Uh, I, I'm inclined to agree with you, by the way. I mean, I, I think coincidence pushes it too far. But, I mean, I don't know what it was. And, by the way, Gonzalo, on this issue of the Moskva, there are enormous numbers of rumours flying around. So one has to be extremely careful because a lot of things have been circulating, which are, are, are to be treated, I think, with great care. There was one I, claim. What, what were those rumors? And this is well, I, I will give them. I will give you one example. Um, a man called Anton Gerashchenko, who I presume you know about, he's a senior official in the Ukrainian Interior Ministry. Mm -hmm. Circulated claims that the captain of the ship had drowned. We ha went down with the ship. <laughs> How would he know? Few, How would he know? Yes, except a few days later, he turned up at a ceremony with the rest of the crew <laughs> in Sevastopol. Oh man! So, I mean, that's <laughs> that's just that's just one example. But you know, you know something. I you know this is uh, you guys know that I used to do a co tread pill content, mm -hmm. which is basically advice to young men as to how to live a life. And and here is a, a, a object lesson: never tell a lie, because yeah. it always comes out. Always, yeah. no exception. Yeah. And and mm -hmm. it's and it's easy for a lie to come out, and especially when you claim that somebody's dead, like in this situation. And um, you know, the guy shows up at. Excuse me, are you? Did you say that he appeared at an award ceremony? Yes. Uh, you know, the, the, what, 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 right. What happened was this: when the crew, worse. yeah, when the crew arrived in Sevastopol, the commander of the Russian Navy came and addressed them all. 
and I believe he did hand out awards and the cats. In his <laughs> oh man. So, so yeah, I, I, my, my thinking at the time of the, this incident, I did a big effort post on, on my telegram channel, which as I've said, and I'm reiterating, I no longer have control over that. Yeah. So anything that appears as of April 15th forward, I, I, it's not me. Okay. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, the, the, my thinking was that it was a successful attack. Um, yeah. And I think it was dreamed up by the forces at Odessa. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that what happened was that it was not okayed by Kiev. And, um, and, and Alex and I were talking about this and I had to crow because that effort post, um, you know, I, I basically said that Kiev would not be happy about this necessarily because they had not played out the Medvedchuk card yet. They had no. uh, Victor Medvedchuk, that they had suddenly captured him, which was absurd, as we all know, because it, for those of you who don't know, Victor Medvedchuk was the leader of uh, uh, the major opposition party to Zelensky. And he was uh, accused of all kinds of nefarious deeds. And of course, it was nonsense. It was all just to... Uh, sideline him politically and he was under house arrest and when um the hostilities broke out and the conflict began all of a sudden he claimed that uh, it was claimed rather that medvedchuk had uh, slipped away from house arrest and was underground and presumably in russia mm -hmm. and then magically uh, um what was it about 10 days ago he appeared that you know and it was claimed that he had been recaptured and some pictures of him were shown that made him look, I mean, he looked the worst for wear, quite frankly. Yes. And it was claimed that uh, they had captured him and all the rest of it. My thinking was that they were pulling him out because they wanted to use him as a negotiating card with yeah. uh, with Putin. Because for those of you who don't know, again, uh, Viktor Medvedchuk, who was a politician here in Ukraine, had longstanding personal ties to um, Vladimir Putin. And... Um, and there was the assumption clearly on the part of the Zelensky regime that they could somehow use him as a bargaining chip. And what was fascinating was that the Russian foreign ministry, not even the office of the president, but the Russian foreign ministry said, well, Viktor Medvedchuk is a Ukrainian citizen. He is not a Russian citizen. So we're not going to trade him for anybody because he's not our problem, which I thought was um, the correct approach, of course, on, on a, on a, on a tactical level in such a situation, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, but I think what had happened was that the um, Zelensky regime was still going to try to figure out a way to, uh, um, to, to uh, 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 leverage the Medvedchuk situation when it was suddenly interrupted by the, the Moskva sinking or our mm -hmm. attack and then sinking. Um, and I think that the Zelensky regime was, quite frankly, I think that they might've been pissed off at the Moskva incident. Which yeah. goes to show you that they are playing just a purely political game. They, they're not, they're not yeah. playing the, 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 you know, we are at war, so we have to win yes. game. Yes. You, you yes. see what I'm saying? Yes, I, I would. I, I, I agree, and I would also add that I get the distinct feeling that the Pentagon was extremely unhappy about the whole affair. I mean, they were very, very careful to, uh, uh, to, to, to slow, uh, um, to be very slow to confirm the Ukrainian claims about the sinking of the Moskva, and they only did so through anonymous officials. I, I get the impression that there's a complicated story here, which we don't know the whole details of. There are a lot of people in both Kiev and Washington and Moscow uh, um, were probably taken by surprise and are very angry about it. And I think there's been some hard words exchanged. And I think there's also been a agreement, a tacit agreement perhaps, to play down the whole incident both uh, are on the, are from every side. So as I said, there's a lot that we don't fully know, but that's all I, I'm going to say about that. Now, um, the other thing I wanted to just say, um, Gonzalo, which has come up very recently, over the last few hours, in fact, is that the EU has been tiptoeing towards uh, an announcing an embargo uh, on Russian imports. Yeah, Alex told me. Oil. I'm laughing. And now, and now, yeah, well, well, and now yeah, Janet Yellen has come out and essentially put the kibosh on it. She said no. And I'm reading oh, this really? the hill. Yeah, Yellen, oh. European ban on Russian energy may do more harm than good. 
During a press conference, this is from the, I'm reading from the, the Hill now. During a Thursday press conference, Yellen said it was essential for the European Union to end its dependence on Russian oil, natural gas, and coal. But a total embargo may do little to hinder Russia's economy whilst crippling Europe with staggering price increases. Um, we need to be careful when we think about a complete ban on, say, oil imports. <laughs> and sure enough, a few hours later, we get information from Josip Borrell, uh, no less, saying that some uh, uh, EU members will say will veto any collective ban on Russian oil. So the European Union currently has no plans of introducing a collective ban on Russian oil supplies. EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Josip Borrell, said. Now, <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, it's all covered. It's all covered Alex, the American. Alex told, Alex and I were talking about this, and Alex told me that the Americans are giving. Um, you know, are, are opening up these strategic petroleum reserves. And yes. uh, Alex, yes. I, I'm not sure if I was correct. You were saying that yes. there was a 1 million barrels a day or something? Well, they've opened, Absolutely. well, the uh, Bloomberg has has reported that the Biden White House is, they've got three ships yeah. moving towards Europe carrying uh, the strategic petroleum reserves to Europe yeah. last week. Yeah. Well, so of course, yeah. you know, Janet Yellen would be saying, no, 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 don't cut off the yeah. Russian oil because Basically, it would make Europe far more dependent on the United States for oil. And the United States is a net oil importer because of yeah. the Biden administration policies. So it would, <coughs> I mean, it's bad enough that the European economy would sink. It would also drag down yeah. the American economy right quick in, in this inflationary uh, spiral. So, so exactly. of course, she's against it. Yeah. Uh, Jesus. That's exactly, that's, that's exactly what you're saying. Morons. They're morons. Yes. Jesus. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, the other the other thing, and I have to say this, the, the, the thought immediately struck me that she must be extremely concerned that an announcement of a EU oil ban now would drive up the price of oil to stratospheric levels in the run up to the November midterms. So <laughs> I wonder whether politics is also playing a role in all of this. But anyway, we were hearing no, lots no. about this oil ban a few days ago. But as I said, it looks as if uh, Janet Yellen and the administration are actually calling a stop to it. And um, as I said, Burrell seems to confirm that that's not going to happen now. So um, that's um, that's perhaps, again, illustrating that, you know, things are not going according to plan or at least someone's plan. I have a telephone call ringing and I suspect it's about you, yeah, Gonzalo. Go. I will be. Yeah, and, 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 and Gonzalo, you could. You, I don't know if you uh, if you saw the message I sent you in the private chat. Mm -hmm. if, if everyone if everyone wants to get in touch with Gonzalo um, now to, to get some statements from, from you. So, Gonzalo, I don't know if you want to pop into the private chat and see. Yeah, I. I, what, I uh, um... What I said, let me, um, no big deal. Yeah. yeah let me uh, to tell you the truth. I'm I'm rather discombobulated and trying to yeah. um, you know get my my head around everything that's that. The uh, internet moves just, fast. <laughs> yeah. Well, not only that, you know, I, I gotta say, you know, th that um, you know, the week of internet detox has been very beneficial. I'll tell you that right now. Okay. Uh, you know, is the uh, the first day, you know, no internet. Uh, you know, I got the shakes bad, you know, and I was like in Midnight Express, you know, or something like that. I was just yeah. completely freaking out. And now it's like all of this information is just a little bit overwhelming. But anyway, um, uh, what else has been going on, Alex? And while we wait for Alexander <laughs> to get back, I'm just like, what the hell, man? I mean, clown world, clown, clown, clown world, man. Absolutely. You know, clown and, and world. You, you are, are, are you are you a tennis fan, Gonzalo? Yeah, sure. Well, Wimbledon oh, uh, is uh, Daniel Medved, Medved, <laughs> yeah. Medvedev. And Belarusian. And Belarusian, by the way. I bet they're not allowing him to play Wimbledon. Uh, Russian and Belarusian tennis players are, for the well, moment, banned. Yeah, I, I'm not a, a follower of tennis, but, you know, I, I know the game, of course. And, and once sometimes, you know, I follow it and pick it up, you know. Uh, and so... Um, yeah, I, I have actually never seen uh, uh, Daniel Medvedev, Medvedev uh, play, but I understand he's the second best in the world. It's yes. absurd. It's it's yeah. absolutely absurd. By the way, is as a Serbian, is um, um, Djokovic. Djokovic 
is he playing or is he? I think he is slated to play. Yeah, I think he's slated to play. But he uh, he came out with a statement uh, the other day and he said it's not right to to ban people because they're Russian. Well, here's the issue. This is collective punishment. And I thought that in the West, that we in the West, we heirs of the enlightenment liberalism were opposed to collective punishment, to collective guilt. I thought that we uh, as a society in the West believe that uh, guilt is individual and that no people, no race can be found guilty collectively of any mm -hmm. crime because I thought that that was the ideal of the Western liberal democracies. And clearly this is not the case. Look, um, when I say, <clears throat> what I'm about to say is this Russophobia, which is obvious, I'm not saying it as, oh, you know, I am, I am pro-Russian or pro-Putin or pro-anything. No, I am anti-discrimination, anti-racism. This is actual racism, okay? When, when, or, or, or racism or, or bigotry of the worst sort when you ascribe collective guilt to an entire nationality. Now, uh, in, insofar as what has happened politically between uh, Russia and Ukraine and militarily between Russia and Ukraine, see a, a tennis player, uh, you know, he is obviously innocent of this because number one, he does not make any of the political decisions. Number two, he does not carry a weapon and go into battle. Okay? He is a tennis player essentially an yeah. entertainer, okay? Yeah. And so for, for him to be blamed, and, and for any Russian, it's just absurd. It's wrong. It's like, what are they doing? You know, I, 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 because they are throwing away every major principle of the West and showing, not they're showing in a way that's so grotesque that all of the liberal principles were just window dressing. We're mm. just... You know, nonsense were just words that were thrown around to get their way. That's what it looks like. And it's a horrible look, if you ask me. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm yeah. back. Can I just say it was about you, Gonzalo? I'll tell you what it was afterwards. Okay. Uh, lots of people want to speak to you. But anyway, let's let's I'll put that aside. But uh, briefly, you're absolutely right. As a British person living in Britain, somebody who used to do lots of discrimination law cases in my day. I was once quite a well-known discrimination lawyer. This is a long time ago. Um, I'm utterly horrified by what Wimbledon has done. I understand that the association that um, is involved in uh, rankings, ranking tennis players, has also spoken out against it. I personally believe that this action is illegal. I think it is a, a gross breach of the uh, various discrimination acts that we have in Britain and which Britain, to a great extent, pioneered. I find it deeply un-British. I mean, you know, it, it's something I just don't recognise in my own country and I'm shocked about it. But there is something else which I find even more shocking, and that is this, that Russians... Russian individuals, Russian businesses, Russian companies that find themselves in this kind of position apparently have great difficulty gaining access to legal representation yeah. that would enable them to contest these things in court. And I'm hearing, I can't confirm this, but I'm hearing that the reason is that they are coming under enormous pressure. British lawyers are being told that if you do act for Russian clients, it won't go well for you. Now, if that is true, and I in fact am quite sure that it is true, yeah, and I, this I, all I originated at the time, the Skripal affair, by the way, when there were the, the, the Russian embassy found it very difficult to bring proceedings um, to um, under the Vienna Convention for precisely that reason in British courts. But if that is true, that is simply appalling. I mean, in Britain, it is a fundamental legal principle that people have a right to representation. And if, they're being, if Russians have been denied representation purely because they are Russians, well, I have to say, I think that is even worse than this illegal and disgraceful step of banning Russian tennis players from Wimbledon and Belarusian tennis players as well, by the way. Yeah, and somebody in chat also said that even Formula One racers. Yeah. This is just dumb. It, it, yeah. I insist, I go back to the, the, the point I, I, I wanted to make is that 
it, it makes all of the principles that built Western civilization ring hollow. This is outrageous. Hello? Am I still there? Hello? Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I, Alexander dropped off. I don't know what happened. Okay. But it's I me and you. We, we hear you. You're fine. You're clear. You're clear. Okay. Well, uh, I'm sure Alex will, Alexander will get back on. But uh, it's in the West, there are certain principles that are the bedrock, the foundation of Western civilization. To betray them this way, it, it not only makes those, those, uh, those ideals hollow, but it, it makes the support for our civilization collapse underneath us. Mm. And, and what I find just despicable is that the current leadership crop across Europe, the, the British Isles, and the North American continent, and, uh, and, and Australia and New Zealand, they, they are so, um, they're so craven, they're so mm. small, they're so little. They, mm. they are people without any kind of, uh, they have no moral conscience. Mm. I, I, I find it outrageous because there is no question that these people are intelligent, but mm. they have no soul, they have no conscience. Uh, that is what I find outrageous because you know, you can find a, a very dumb farmer who is a better man because he might mm. be dumb, but he knows right from wrong. And he knows that there are certain things that you can't do because they're just wrong. Mm. And these very intelligent people who are in charge of things in the West, they mm. don't have that moral sense at all. It's, it's, it's almost as if it's, it's been ripped out of them somehow or, or eroded from them or deliberately removed somehow in some very complex operation that removed any kind of moral sensibility. That's what seems to be the case in the West. And it's mm. outrageous. Yeah. It's a tragedy. Yeah. yeah. So Sorry. it is. So um, before we went live, Gonzalo, and before, actually, like five minutes before Alexander got on, the, uh, we were having mm. a, a private uh, talk on. Yeah. On, uh, on the streaming software. That's how we're communicating. It's via the streaming software. Uh, Gonzalo, you were giving your take about the economic situation. I was kind of filling you in. Yes. Uh, we talked about the oil. We talked about the dollar and uh, and all of these things. Do you want to give your uh, your take, yeah, Gonzalo, as to how you see things? I, I was filling yeah. you in a little bit. I don't know if, Alexander, you want to fill in any other pieces about the economic No, no. I, I, I think... I, and, I, well, I, well, worldwide this, inflation. This, German... Can, producer prices in March increased by 30%. Now, that is the highest rate of increase since, the since 1949, since the foundation of the German Federal Republic. German inflation yeah. is rising much faster than it did in the 1970s. And in uh, the Netherlands, it's now in double figures, official headline well, inflation. That's, that's why and I this pointed out to, to uh, Alex uh, that, mm. you know, the Netherlands is it was claiming that they had 12% inflation. And the thing is, see, the Dutch are very um, rigorous and honest about those kinds of things. Yes. And not so the rest of Europe. Yeah, so I think exactly. that the Dutch numbers are absolutely yeah. true. And I think that yes. the rest of Europe is probably lying. Yeah. Um, you know, even, you know, the French keep saying that, oh, they have all this nuclear energy and that's why, you know, their, their inflation is much less. I don't believe it. I think that, that the inflation numbers in the Eurozone are a lot higher. And Alex was telling me before, um, before, before we went live and before you, Alexander joined us that, um, that the, the, um, the dollar was strengthening against the Euro and also that the ruble was really strong. Now, yeah. About the ruble, my thinking is that um, Elvida, uh, what's her name? Nabulina. 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 Yeah. 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 Nabulina. I, I have a terrible time with names. But anyway, uh, Elvira Nabulina, uh, she is, uh, well, very, very capable. And so she has a double problem. On the one hand, she wants to keep interest rates high because mm -hmm. she wants to uh, keep you know, uh, uh, people plugged in, people in Russia and the rest of the yeah. world to a lesser extent, yeah. but people in Russia certainly plugged into the ruble. On the other hand, she's going to have to start printing some rubles because yeah. she doesn't want the ruble to get that strong. And I don't think that they can do, that the Russian Central Bank can do that kind of fine tuning of be able, yeah. being able to dial in the right uh, mm. interest rate in order to soften the ruble, and yet at the same time, uh, mm. uh, attract capital into Russia. And so mm. I think that she's going to have to do what seems to be contradictory. 
of upping the interest rates, but putting out more rubles in, in mm. the foreign exchange markets yeah. because she doesn't want her the ruble to go out of sight, which it possibly can. You got to keep in mind for for a central banker, the 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 month of March mm. must have been a complete nightmare for that poor woman yeah. because all of a sudden the ruble went from it was roughly 80 uh, rubles to the dollar, if, I, if I'm if i not mistaken. It shot mm -hmm. up all the way to 145, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. Yeah. and then floated right back down. That must have, you know, that kind of roller coaster ride for a, for a central banker, mm -hmm. uh, she wants to split her wrists, okay? That, that kind yeah. of thing is not something that any central banker wants to see. And I think also, I mean, there is no question in my mind that when the um, the dollar went parabolic against the ruble, that Elvira um, Nebulina went out there and sold dollars like there's no tomorrow. She must have yeah. emptied out her, her, her checking account of dollars for the central mm -hmm. bank in order to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, prop up the ruble. I mean, of course, that's what you're going to do if you're the central banker. You're not going to allow your, your currency to be annihilated in, in a matter of weeks. But when it was clear that everybody started realizing, hold on a second, the Russians have all these commodities. They're in the driver's seat insofar as yeah. commodities are concerned. And the Europeans are, you know, they're the beggars in this relationship. Mm. And all of a sudden, the equations flipped and everybody started getting yeah. into rubles. And she didn't want the ruble to get so strong yeah. that yeah. it prices out the uh, Russian economy. So she's she's having to do this, this game that must be really nerve-wracking for her as a central banker. But um, I, I was looking at the... Um, the exchange rate on, on, uh, on it was just on Google. It was not you know because I don't have access to my old accounts. Mm -hmm. but, um, but on Google, it seemed it seemed that it was fairly stable over the last few weeks. Yeah. It was getting a little yeah. strong, but not out of sight strong. That is, it yeah. wasn't like um, you know forty five rubles to the dollar, which would be a nightmare for Elvira Nubelina. She yeah. want, wants it to be relatively soft. She wants it at yes. eighty. That's a nice price, right? And so. Uh, she has all kinds of problems, but she's in the driver's seat because even yes. though, and, and and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I, I sort of like glance at some headlines. The Americans are going to steal those uh, reserves that they sanctioned. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, um, Sullivan. 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 Yes. Sullivan actually said that there is no possibility of Russia ever recovering those reserves. Yeah, I know. He said that, uh, you know, before my my last week. But yeah, uh, um, yeah. that's the narrative. I mean, nobody's contradicting that. Right. I mean, yeah. that's uh, that's where we're yeah. headed. Right. Because that would yes. be the greatest theft in world history. Yes. I mean, that is the largest single theft in human history. Yes. Well, that's incredible, man. Anyway, uh, uh, to get back to the, the economic issue, um, Alex mentioned how the dollar was strengthening vis-a-vis -vis the euro. I think what it is is institutional money. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, again, I don't have access to the numbers. This is an educated guess or an educated speculation, call it what you will, but it seems reasonable that the uh, institutional investors would have been um, rotating out mm -hmm. of euro bonds and euro denominated assets into mm -hmm. dollar denominated assets, uh, especially the big insurance companies, because they probably see what's coming. And so they probably want to keep their, 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 their dry powder they mm. want to keep it in dollars because they figure that this wave, this this inflation, this this commodity driven inflation that is going to be hitting Europe and the United States eventually. I mean, when I say eventually, I mean by the end of the year, not like five, mm. ten years from now. I'm talking now, okay? Yeah. But I think this big wave of inflation is going to hit Europe first, and then mm. uh, uh, it'll hit the the Americas. And so I think mm. that what the um, the 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 institutional money is thinking is get out of the euro now, get into the dollar. Let's see what happens with the euro. And at the moment is right. We'll get out of whatever dollar positions we have into something else. But the issue becomes, of course, what is this something else? Uh, and, and that's an issue. It could be. And, and I'm spitballing here. Uh, and I haven't seen the the index numbers that might confirm this. So you know, really take this with a with a boulder of salt. But it could be that come you know September, August, you know between July and September, a lot of this institutional money starts to see, hey, the dollar is starting to inflate. 
food prices are rising. Let's exit our dollar positions and get into big commodity positions. And it becomes a self-reinforcing spiral where all of this institutional money exits the dollar, exits treasury bonds, and goes into commodities, uh, into, into, of course, futures. Okay, Because for those of you who listen, it's not that people go out and buy you know, a ton of aluminum or a thousand barrels of oil. No, they buy futures, mm-hmm. which are just contracts. It's just paper money, paper assets. Mm-hmm. And so I, I would think that they would do that in the third quarter of the year. And mm-hmm. this might prove even worse for inflation of the dollar by the end of the year. You, you see my rationale? Absolutely. Can I just say, first of all, uh, um, Gonzalo, and I just want to make this observation. Um, after all you've been through over the last few days, your mental energy astonishes me. And I no, think no, I, there, want to, there, I really there, want to say this, that, this like, that, that you're no, no, able to no, talk about no, Alexander, Alexander, like this. You, yeah. you, 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 you totally don't get it, man. Because you know, you know what this is like for me? Uh, this is like being in junior high and talking about favorite rock bands. This is uh, fun. I could do this all day, okay? And and poor Chad, you're going to have to listen to this garbage of me because yeah. I love talking about this stuff and I could go on for ages. It, it, it's a mental break for me, believe me. So I, I just want to make sure that I'm not boring people silly with this. Uh, you're, not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not boring anybody. Uh, Gonzalo, I'm going to flesh out some of the things you've said, which to a great extent corroborate the point that you've made. Now, a few days ago, uh, Maxim Oreshkin, who is one of Putin's uh, economic advisors, So that the enormous problem that Russia has at the moment, the single biggest problem in its financial system, is that Russia currently is running a absolutely gargantuan trade surplus because um, Western companies have pulled out of Russia. Imports are far, far down, far, far down. And the Russian exports have to some extent been affected in terms of volumes. They have increased massively in terms of price. So Russia is running a gargantuan trade surplus at the moment. The problem it's is having is that the the money that's pouring into Russia at a speed that nobody has ever seen in dollars and euros is money that they cannot place outside Russia. Because if they do, then it could be confiscated. It could be seized uh, under sanctions, as we've seen has happened previously. So this money is part this foreign currency is piling up in Russia. Can't be used there because, of course, it would you can't, you know, Russia's currency is the euro is the ruble. It's not dollars and euros. But if it's all converted into rubles, then you could easily see the ruble rise to 45 rubles to the dollar. Oh, Which yeah, but I, I think there's one problem. thing you're, you're missing. You're, you're, yeah. I, I think you're, yeah. you're missing, and I think a lot of economists are missing. Mm. Yeah. Do you know where you would go and park all those dollars? China. Well, I know. China. Because right well, now, they are not on, on the, well, they're beginning on the sanctions escalator, that wonderful yeah. phrase yes. of yours. But they can go to China and say, look at all these dollars we got. Yes. Give me, uh, give me RMB, yeah. or or get me, you yeah. know, whatever, and do something with these dollars and these euros that I can't do anything with, but you can, yes. and yes. we'll come up with some sort of uh, mechanism to to swap out. That's the yes. way it would be, it would be done. And uh, if, uh, this uh, capital by the for the Chinese, they could put it to good use, and and you know, it, it's. Excuse me. It's all good for both parties. You, you see what I'm saying? I, I have no doubt at all that that's happening, by the way. But of course, to to sort this all out in terms of the volumes of currency that is pouring into Russia at the moment is going to take a, a, a couple of weeks or months to sort out. And that's the other thing I wanted to say, because, of course, Mabulina has also been speaking. And we've also now got a fair idea of what happened in March and over the course of March. Nabalina did exactly what you said. She increased the interest rates to 20%. She's now shaved them down to 17%, by the way, as the mm-hmm. underlying inflation rate in Russia has started to fall. The headline numbers are still going up, but the actual rate of increase is now dipping. In fact, it's starting to go downward. And um, at the same time, she increased liquidity. 
throughout the banking system. She actually did exactly what you said. She increased interest rates, but at the same time, essentially printed rubles. Now, I understand that process stopped sometime in March. What is happening is that simultaneously with the um, the current account, Russia's current account, going to gigantic surplus, the Russian budget has also been going into gigantic surplus. And that is pro providing an enormous amount of funds on the fiscal side, which yeah. the Russian government is using to flood the economy. So that that's what they're doing at the moment. Now, you know, it's going to be a difficult balancing act, exactly as you said. But that at the present time is what they're doing. As for oh, the... Yeah, there's something else, too, that, that has to be pointed out. See, when you have, uh, um, uh, like, Russian inflation, last I heard, was around 17% annualized, right? And that kind of inflation is high. In most developed um, economies, it would be, you know, pro political suicide. But in Russia, because of the current situation with this conflict, and because the, um, the political wind is at uh, Putin and the Kremlin's back, and Nabulina's back as well, in that the Russian people approve of what's going on, support it. They were very badly disabused by the Europeans and their sanctions and their Russophobia. All of this has contributed to the Russians, uh, you know, fervently supporting their, their government. W whatever you think of the government, that's not the issue. The issue is the reality of the situation. The Russian public, you like it or not, are totally behind Putin. The numbers prove it. And therefore, they're going to have even more uh, um, leeway insofar as what they pursue into the future. And because the people are so in favor of the government, any setback along the way, the people will just shrug it off. Unlike what is going to happen in the Western uh, societies, where this inflation is starting to have a huge backlash, and we haven't even come close to either the inflation, the peak of the inflation, or the peak of the backlash. And so we're, we're about to enter in the West a period of enormous political, internal political instability, whereas the Russians are basically, you know, they're all united. And whatever comes their way, negatively speaking, the people and the government will all shrug it off. And so you have, it, it, it's very important to understand how in the West, it's going to cause enormous political instability and potentially some institutional collapse, dare I say, in certain aspects of the of the Western regimes. Whereas in in Russia, it's smooth sailing as far as I can see. And again, I have to insist, I'm just stating this as a dispassionate observer. I, I'm not in favor or against anybody. I'm just saying, you know, looking at the at the chessboard as it stands right now, this is my my thinking. What do you guys think? Alexander, you have to uh, yeah, unmute. Yeah, unmute. That's yeah. right. okay, I, yeah. I, 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 I think that's right. What I just wanted to say is this. I mean, I, Russian inflation is a complex story because no. I understand that consumer goods have increased radically in value. Many consumer goods, particularly those which re relied upon uh, Western imported subcomponents. And, you know, uh, um, Nabulina gave an example, for example, that, you know, if you're talking about the garment industry, Russia produces most of its own clothes, but it imported buttons from the European Union. <laughs> Strange things like that. Really? So they have to set up their own production of buttons. Easy to do, not particularly difficult, won't take very long. Somebody's going to do it. Uh, you know, some private en enterprise or operation is going to do some entrepreneur is going to make a huge amount of money. But in the in the meantime, there is shortages of garments and those that do exist are going to be more costly. That's that's a given. But sure. other parts of the economy, the, 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 the retail economy, food and energy, which Russia has in abundance, the staples there in food and of course in oil and such things at the moment they are remaining remaining reasonably stable so they provide an anchor which prevents the whole inflation cycle getting spiraling upwards and at the same time it also provides some protection 
in terms of living standards. The Russians will get over this. There's been some debate about how long it will take. The prime minister seem, seems to think it will take six months. Nabulina seems to think it will take a bit longer, perhaps a year. The most pessimistic is Alexei Kudrin, who was the finance minister in the 2000s, who many people see as pro-Western. He thinks it will take about two years, but even he thinks that the Russians will do it. So, you know, the Russians do expect that one way or another, their economy will be able to stabilize within a relatively short time. I mean, six months to two years in this kind of scenario, it's not a catastrophe, as the Russians yeah. themselves would say. Now, yeah. in the West, I'm afraid you're absolutely right. We are now in a structural inflation crisis, and we're only at the beginning of it. And mm -hmm. um, if we do eventually start cutting ourselves off from Russian oil and Russian gas, well, we're going to make our problems far bigger. And of course, that's not just us saying that. That's now Janet Yellen as well. But I can't believe that even her wise counsels are going to prevail in the in the hysterical atmosphere we have at the moment. Mm -hmm. And by the it way, I share. Uh, yes, indeed. And I, by the way, I also share completely your cynicism about the inflation numbers we're getting in the West, I, 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 and certainly in the European Union. I, mm. I do not believe that if producer prices in Germany are rising at the rate of 30% a month, that retail prices are only rising at a level of about 8%. I think even that discrepancy is too great, even at this rather early stage in the inflation cycle. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Hello? Yes, we, we, we're all ears, Gonzalo. We're all ears. Oh, no, no, no. I, I don't have anything to add uh, okay. I, 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 insofar as the, this is concerned. I, I'd just be repeating what I said. What other thing happened this week? You, you see, you see, chat, this is what I do. You know, it, it, people don't know this, but every Let week me. I call up Alex and Alexander and I, I say, well, what happened this week? You know, and they tell me. And then I start like uh, spitballing and bullshitting my well, way through the show. Well, let's, well, let's and, and that's how it happens. That's how the magic is made. Let's do this. Let's do this, Gonzalo. Let's ask the chat what uh, news topics, news topics you would like uh, Gonzalo and Alexander to weigh in on. But while the chat is is putting that in, I'll, and I'll pick the, the popular topics, and I'll uh, I'll uh, throw it your way. But um, but while we're doing that, there are a oh, lot wait, of questions. Wait, sorry, sorry. Sorry, there's something that came up here. Somebody said here in the chat that Imran Khan is going to be on George Galloway. Um, I was supposed to be on George Galloway's yeah, show last Sunday. On Friday. And yeah, no, last Sunday. Yeah, I last saw, Sunday. Sorry. I saw earlier um, this incredibly uh, uh, kind statement uh, from George. And I just want to, uh, George, if I hope that you hear this and uh, somebody here in chat, please uh, clip this part here and send it to him, please. I, I implore you. George, thank you so much for your kind wishes. And thank you so much for having, um, you know, put such a spotlight on me. I owe you a show and uh, I am a man of my word and I will be on your show if you'll have me, of course. And I promise I am going to prepare like quips and jokes and it's gonna be the best show you ever had because I can never repay you for your, your kindness and how you um, made such a big fuss, which I think uh, that big fuss that you, I, I certainly think that you were a big impetus in that, in that fuss has really helped me out. So George, I owe you a show and I, I can't wait to see you. And uh, well, see you virtually, of course. And I, I, I thank you. I thank you so much. And if it's true that Imran Khan is going to be on George Galloway's show, I, I think it's going to be a great show. And I, I fervently endorse, endorse George, and I wish him just the best with his interview with Imran Khan. Yeah. Sorry right. about that. I just wanted to get great. that. No, super. Uh, yeah, he did. He did say a lot of uh, very kind words uh, and yes. very, uh, very uh, encouraging words about about you, Gonzalo, and about. Uh, getting your uh, your release. So George Galloway was really um, one of those voices that was speaking up for, for your safety. Uh, Alexander, yeah. since you have a, a, a photographic memory, I'm going to throw some topics your way, and then you and uh, Gonzalo can, can talk about them. I'm just looking in the chat. I see Finland and Sweden, NATO. I see Julian Assange. I see Mariupol and Azovstal. 
I also see the recent fires in the um, the Russian military uh, research yes. centers. Two fires that broke off. Let me see some other topics. Uh, fire uh, where in the Russian? We'll, what? We'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Yes, yeah. this is an interesting story. This is very recent, actually, to today, mm -hmm. pretty yeah. much. And what else do we see? Um, I think those are the ballistic weapons, the Samrat and the ballistic uh, yes. ballistic weapons. Yes. Okay, yes. so those are good topics. Before you guys get into it, I just want to say that we have a lot of super chats uh, coming in, a lot of uh, well wishes for you, Gonzalo, and some questions. The questions, we'll, we'll figure out a way to answer the questions in, in a later mm -hmm. show or video. But uh, Gonzalo, what do you say if um, I gather all the, the super chats and uh, we donate them to some sort of charity or cause? I don't know if you want to pick the cause, Gonzalo, or if you would like me to donate it to something here like a church or, or, or some cause here. Well, um, yeah, I leave it uh, to you. That, that's very kind of you. And I very much appreciate you, that very kind offer of you, you, uh, of you both. I know that you both uh, have thought of this idea. And uh, yes, I, um, I, I don't know which charity to tell you the truth, because I, uh, you, you want to leave it to me, leave okay, it to I, you. But the okay. charity that I want to support is for the family members of anybody who has been, um, uh, 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 harmed or um, anybody who's been in a situation that I have, that they have been snatched up for uh, relatively trivial reasons, or, you know, not, not, you know, committing any crime as you would de properly define it, but rather speaking their mind and pointing to things that were wrong or untrue and trying to make them right. Mm -hmm. I, I hate all of these, you know, uh, organized, uh, um, uh, charities like I don't know Amnesty International or yeah, whatnot. No, 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 always, we're not gonna... <laughs> they always feel like a grift yeah. for the. Administrator. We're not going to give it there. We're not. That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. no, I know. I know. I know you guys are. are you know. You. You. you well, guys. You and I. You know. Think the same in, in that regard. But I'd like it to be something like that. Or also, uh, Julian Assange. Hmm. Julian. What has happened hmm. to Julian Assange? He is going to be, um, as yeah. I understand it, he's going to be extradited to the United States to stand trial on espionage charges, which makes absolutely hmm. no sense because number one, Julian Assange is not an American citizen. He is an Australian citizen. Number two, he has never spied for anyone. He simply passed along and 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 published information that other people had obtained. And so then the notion that he is a spy is absurd. The notion that he should be tried in an American court, which has no jurisdiction, is absurd. And I think that uh, that would be, uh, um, you know, if, if you can divvy it up, give a mm -hmm. piece to the legal defense of um, Julian Assange. I know, Alexander, you, you know the people there, if not personally, yeah. you know them, you know, indirectly. Yes. Uh, who are defending Julian Assange. Because I, I know some of them. Yes, I, I absolutely do know some of them. Yes. Yeah. And, and Alexander, correct me if I'm wrong uh, in, in what I said about Julian Assange, that there's no legal basis for what is happening to him. And it's a disgrace. I am absolutely of that view. I think it is an absolute disgrace. I, I did a discussion of his case. Oof, you can find it on Consortium News. I did it a couple of months ago, um, and you can you can see it there. I am fully in agreement of what you have said, and of course, his lawyers are going to need a lot of money <laughs> to fight whatever oh. comes, either in America or in Britain. They do get a lot of funding from various sources, but I just good, don't good. say that. Then, too. then do this. Then do this. Um, no, no. Can you? Uh, of, I, I hate to, to put this like this, but would it be possible yeah. for a, a sizable fraction to be devoted to Eva Bartlett? Eva Bartlett is a journalist who is yeah. going to the Donbass regularly. And yeah. she is, you know, at sixes and sevens insofar as funding is concerned. She could really use that mm -hmm. to, to do her reporting. And she's somebody whom I respect and trust. And I think that she, she would be a deserving person. And as well as... Um, um, what's his name? Lancaster. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. My, my, yeah. my memory is slipping. What's his name? Peter, right? Patrick. Patrick. Yeah. Patrick. 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 I'm sorry. It's a, I'm like I said. I'm a little bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, Patrick Lancaster. You know, mm -hmm. another man. Yeah. That guy. Uh, I'm sorry for being so vulgar when I say this, but it's the truth. That guy has balls. I that know. guy, dude, dude. He, he's all kinds of ballsy, and he has shown a lot of stuff. So Eva and, and, and Patrick, you know, you have my warmest, warmest regards and my 
absolute respect and keep on doing what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, All right. we'll take care of it. Okay. So um, I, I gave uh, I gave you some news topics, Alexander. Yes. I just wanted topics. to add one, which yeah. I noticed nobody has mentioned, which is, of course, the French election, which is coming up very soon. Yeah, it's in the chat, too. It's, oh, yeah, it's yeah. That's my bad. Too. That's my I mean, bad. Yeah, it's French yeah. election. I mean, and I just wanted to say very briefly, there was they, they had that debate. Um, uh, Macron and Le Pen on Wednesday. I think by most most people would concede neither it wasn't a knockout from either side. I personally take the view that Le Pen came out with the edge. I thought that you know she's not she's not a debater like Macron is, but I think that she said more things that are more uh, you know more relevant to the lives of people in France. And I I, I have to say that I still think though Macron will win in the end, because the institutional weight of events is just too strong in France for Le Pen to overcome. But an upset, an upset is not impossible. And if it happens, it's very connected to the inflation crisis that we were talking about before. Now, lots of other topics, lots of other things. Now, about about uh, Le, Pen, Le Pen and, and, uh, uh, and Macron. Yeah, Macron. Uh, Macron. Yeah. Uh, Alex told me uh, about the uh, about the results, and, and it's very much in line with what you said. And so, yeah. from my perspective, um, my my thinking is that if Le Pen were to win, the yeah. uh, bureaucracy, the entrenched bureaucracy, French bureaucracy, would go out of its way to block any initiative she might have. So yeah. it would be a, a, a repeat of the uh, Trump presidency. And so, I, I frankly, I, I I think it's almost a pointless election. Macron wins and they go steady as she goes. Le Pen wins and they block her and they do all kinds of things. Um, you know, I mean, and, and I, um, she she isn't going to be able to do anything because she doesn't yeah. have that uh, um, depth of support within the French bureaucracy, which is so powerful in 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 French society. You see what I'm saying? I absolutely agree. I mean, in fact, I'm going to say something else. I mean, there's going to be a massive attempt at that point afterwards, if she were to win, to mm -hmm. make sure that her party loses in the yeah. French parliamentary election. And I've now been seeing some moves by Jean-Luc Mélenchon. And it's quite clear to me that he's manoeuvring now, very obviously, to win a majority uh, for his left party in the French parliamentary elections, which presumably will follow sometime in the summer, whoever wins. And that it, regardless, as you, I, I mean, when you talk about what happened to Trump in the US, what's going to happen to Le, uh, a President Le Pen in France is going to make what was done to Trump seem frankly minor. And of course, yeah. the bureaucracy in Paris will have the support of the EU bureaucracy in Brussels. And I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be absolutely enormous. And uh, what I would say, though, is I still think it will be an enormous electoral shock. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the other thing to say. I mean, I think that the uh, 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 Brussels, shall we say, and its supporters, its fan club around the world would not be happy. Anyway, that's that's what I'm going to say about that. I mean, we may have much more to say about the French elections going forward, but. That's one thing I wanted to say. Second is about just to, just to deal with a few a few quick things. The Sarmat um, intercontinental ballistic missile that was tested. The Russians tested it a few uh, uh, a day or so ago. This is the most powerful intercontinental ballistic missile ever built. It's not even properly speaking an intercontinental ballistic missile because it is it, it it has global reach it can reach not just go across continents it can reach right anywhere in the globe and it, it's capable of circumnavigating it's, it's uh, of going over the south pole and striking the united states from the south where of course the u.s air, air, air defense and anti-missile systems they don't have their radars they're all looking north so there's a mm -hmm. massive thing now um what you probably aren't aware of gonzalo is that there's been lots of talk over the last couple of days that about the russians supposedly desperate supposedly losing the war in ukraine contemplating the use of uh nuclear weapons 
in what? tactical nuclear weapons <laughs> to win in Ukraine. There's been well, I mean, even no less a, no less a person than the director of the CIA, William Burns, uh, um, actually seemed to give some life to that particular story. I mean, it was a crazy one. The Russians have said this is ridiculous that they have no such plans, but that they consider it to be an example of mirror imaging. And yes. I think that's probably yes. true. Yes. So I, I, I think, and Alex thinks, we both think, that the Sarmat test was not just part of this missiles um, you know, test program. It was both, a, both right. it was also a, a warning and a reminder that if anybody yeah, has I, any I, such um, idea. <laughs> yeah, before, before we, uh, we got on live, yeah. Alex was telling me about this missile, mm -hmm. and he mentioned yeah. that it was... It had a range of 18,000 kilometers. Is, is that correct? Yes. That's correct, yes. Okay, because yes. I just Googled this. I, I don't know this off the top of my head, but let's pretend that I did. But I just Googled the circumference of the Earth, which is 40,000 kilometers. So oh, this well, missile okay. can literally reach a, 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 the antipathy, the antipode, rather, of wherever it's yes. fired. It can yes. literally go around the Earth. Yes. That is a powerful weapon, okay? Absolutely. And I'll, but anyway, um, no, I, was, uh, I, was Andy, say, I don't think it's ballistic then. Then it must be some sort of like glider because a ballistic well, missile would you literally get to the to, to the to the moon and back. But anyway, that's, that's not important. The important well, thing is that if, if we have a missile like this, <laughs> I, I think that you might be right because to to make such a test at, at such a weird moment, because this is a major test, because this is a major weapon system. To, yeah. So to make such a test now it doesn't make sense no. you see what i'm saying Absolutely. unless you're trying to send a very very clear message yes uh, i would also add by the way that it carries hypersonic warheads so it has this enormous reach and it carries hypersonic war warheads as well so it's got tremendous power and potential but so I think that's what that's all about. And I, I, I agree. Now, Finland, Sweden joining NATO. Um, I, I think this has been worked on for a very long time. I think this has been a plan that's been worked on in Sweden and Finland. The political class there have gradually been won over to this for a very long time. I think that Ukraine has provided both a pretext, but also in terms of bringing it on now, it's a kind of consolation prize for the NATO bureaucracy because they are losing Ukraine. Now, I've had discussions with people about this. I want to stress again, I am not a military person. But what I understand is this, from a Russian point of view, losing, having Ukraine join NATO would be an existential crisis. It's huge. It's uh, um, location means yeah. that it, you can when you put missiles there you can reach right to the heart of the most important areas of Russia that would have been a disaster for them having Finland and Sweden and in NATO um, are, is not existential in the same way more importantly it simplifies Russian military planning because if there were ever to be a third world war, which heaven forbid, the major battleground, it looks like conventional battleground, would no longer be in Central Europe, but it would be in the Arctic. It would be useful for Russia, to say it straightforwardly, to occupy the Scandinavian peninsula. Doing that would have been extremely difficult while Finland and Sweden were neutral. So given the overwhelming preponderance of Russian power in this region, actually having Finland and Sweden in uh, um, NATO actually simplifies Russian strategic planning. I don't want to give the impression that this is what the Russians want to see, but it's something that um, I have heard and I believe it to be true. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not 100 percent on on this, to tell you the truth, yeah. Um, yeah. because I've always felt that, you know, Finland and Russia have deep, deep oh, uh, financial yeah. ties and cultural ties. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, regardless of the of the you know unpleasantness of 1939, 1940. Yeah. Uh, you know, Finland and Russia go a long ways back, even you know before the end of the Soviet Union. And so uh, the Russians always viewed Finland as a buffer zone. Yes. Uh, and and so for them to for the Finns yes. to yes. decide to you know join NATO, I think it's foolish of them. I think it's reckless. Oh. Um, you know, it, it, and the thing is, see, uh, having a buffer, a neutral buffer in Finland, mm. um, you know, kept NATO at bay, kept them, you know, yes. in Norway. Yes. Or, or yes. I mean, Norway is a NATO member, right? I, I, yes, I it is absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And so, so Sweden and Finland joining, officially joining NATO, because, you know, we, there was always a fiction that they weren't NATO, but they did join yes. NATO, they were yes. NATO interoperable. Um, and, and so there was the, the, the fiction and also it just reduced tension. Uh, yes. Having them join NATO just amps up the tension, even if it's a, a really a bureaucratic move as a practical military matter, nothing really changes. Mm. It, it just increases the political tension, which I think is foolish. Um, yes. uh, that's that there. So I'm, I'm not really sure that the Russians are, they might yeah. view it as yeah. amplification, but you got to have you have to understand now. All of a sudden, NATO can put, you know, surface to surface missiles, you know, right there in front of Saint Petersburg. Yes. Okay. That's yes. Not something yes. that I really like. Okay. I mean, nobody yes. would like it. So it is no, a provocation. Uh, uh, and it, the other the other point I would I I I most vehemently disagree with you, is that you said you talk about the Third World War as a future. Uh, event, uh, uh, hopefully an event that won't happen. My friend, and you know how much I respect you, but I do believe that we are in the Third World War. It has been yeah. going on ever since this, uh, this this special military operation started, and uh, there's no end in sight. It, it's yeah. it's it's economic, it's political, it's military, it's social. Yes. Yes. I, uh, I, th I think that we haven't even started to see the real social warfare that's going to start breaking yes. out. On yes. both sides of the divide, by the way, there are going to be people yeah. in China, in Russia, that are not happy with the situation on that side of the divide. Just as on the Western side, there are a whole host of people, ourselves included, by the way, mm. who mm. reject a mainstream narrative, who reject uh, uh, the the um, the blob or, or the, mm -hmm. the swamp or call it what you will. And, and so, you know, it, it, it's it's the Third World War is happening already. You know, yes. that, that's and, yes. and I'm, I'm telling you this, you know, with the deepest respect and regard, of course. But uh -huh. that's how I see it. You know, I think that we're there. We just yeah. have to admit it to ourselves and, and start picking yes. sides and figuring out how we're going to fight this thing. Because yes. it, it, it's happening. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, 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 what I meant to say was, I mean, uh, outright all out combat operations between the Western powers and the Russians. We're not quite there yet, and that's what I meant. I no, hope we don't no, get no, that. Alex, Alexander, we're there. We're there. Yeah. You know, you have to keep in mind. You know, the Ukrainian yeah. armed forces were NATO trained, NATO equipped. Yes, yes they used a uh, uh, Russian tank, Soviet tanks. Yes, but in terms of communications and command and control, yeah. it was NATO. They were trained to, yes. to NATO interoperability yes. standards. And here's yes. something key. The Ukrainian armed forces were the only ones of NATO's forces that had actual combat experience, because yeah. between you know 2013 and up until this point, they had had this relentless grind in the Donbass yeah. uh, that had gotten hotter in 2014, 15, and then cooled down, but it was still relentless over the yeah. past eight years, nine years, and and now we have open war. These are the best. Um, most experienced fighters mm. Mm. that NATO had. Yeah. If you think of it in those terms, then you understand why NATO decided deliberately not to get involved in this no. fight, because NATO was involved, yes. and they yeah. they got their behinds handed to them uh, yes. by the Russians in, in in what is proving to be one of the most remarkable uh, military um, encounters in the last hundred years. Well, yes, uh, I, 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 uh, sorry, am I, no, I, I am, I'm not, I am, I am unmuted. Yes, well, I, I, I hear all that, Gonzalo. I, I, I stand corrected. Let, let me put it like. Oh, that. I mean, I'm, you know, it's, it's not like it's, it's just, it's just a point of view. You know, it's not like a competition. <laughs> but, but anyway, 
did just to deal with those two other points, the buffer zone point. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I, I want to stress again, the Russians do not want to see Finland and Sweden joining NATO. They've never had a good relationship with Sweden. The two countries have never particularly got on. But with Finland, as you rightly say, they have in the, historically had a good and friendly relationship. So that will be a blow to them. And that there is no question at all. But in military terms, and this is, I think, an important thing, it's probably less important now than it was during the Cold War when the major front was in Central Europe. Because at that point, the Russians would not have wanted a NATO counterattack, if you like, through Scandinavia whilst they were focused on the central front. Whereas today, to say it straightforwardly, it is in the Arctic and in the North Atlantic that the major battle would take place. And um, as I said, having to skirt Finland would have been, and Sweden would have been more of a problem than a, than a solution. Now, on the question of the missiles, NATO planting missiles and nuclear weapons in Finland, that obviously is a major concern. But of mm -hmm. course those weapon systems would also be easily, much more easily targeted for the Russians than if they were further west. So I, I, I again, I think that this is a concern. I don't want to underestimate these problems. No, I, but I, 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 I don't think it is, as, it, it is as existential for them as it would have been if Ukraine had gone into NATO, all the more so, of course. I mean, we talk about cultural links between Finland and Russia the cultural links between Ukraine and Russia are, uh, uh, you know, orders of magnitude stronger. Yeah. So that's, that, that's, that's what I wanted to say about that. What I would say is I completely agree with you about Finland and Sweden making crazy and stupid decisions. And if you look at Finland, I mean, it, it looks to me as if Finland, which once upon a time had serious people leading it. I mean, I remember... Yeah. President yeah. Kekkonen. I mean, today, the current Finnish government, I, I understand the prime minister is in her mid 30s. They look like. She's a me. party girl. You I know, are they, too, they, too polite. She is a party yeah. girl. Well, well, you know? they they look they look to me to be a collection of Annalena Beerbox, to be straightforward. Mm, I mean, mm. they're 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 at, they're at, they're at that level. I mean, you know, they 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 as you said, dizzy. They want to be invited to all the right parties. You, those parties don't happen in Moscow, if you like. They happen in Brussels and wherever New York, and uh, that that seems to be the the sort of idea there. I mean, it, it's it it's stupid and crazy and i think one day people in finland are going to wake up and of course they're not going to be consulted because it's not going to be a referendum on anything like this because that's obviously you don't consult your people when you make these major of course decisions. not that would, be, that, would be, that would be outrageous that would be anti-democracy it would oh, open the way to populists. <laughs> exactly it would open the way to populists and people of that kind you know uh, uh, what? So, people uh, you determining know, and, their uh, own uh, destiny? What outlandish dishtosh? Yeah, I did. I did. And if you had the wrong result after a referendum, well, you'd have to go to all the trouble and expense of having the referendum all over again. <laughs> so you don't want the referendum. <laughs> so, so, so exactly. So we're going to have the decision made and pushed on the Finnish people and the Swedish people. And of course, it's going to be a very bad decision. And it's going to complicate their lives and make them different from what they were. And it's going to make Finland, which had a very distinct personality and culture. I don't know Sweden very well. I've been to Finland several times. And it was it's, it's an actually, it's a likable place. I liked it. It's going to make it less different and quirky and interesting and attractive. And it's going to make it part of the homogenized Europe that you know, Euro-Atlantic Europe that we've seen, you know, and, and, you know, always assuming that things don't escalate to the point where, um, you know, the crisis gets to the kind of beyond control levels where we really all are wondering whether anything matters anymore. But anyway, that, that's what I wanted to say about that. Now, um, Alex, I don't have a photographic memory. You mentioned other topics. Mm. 
Um, neither do I. Uh, there's Boris's <laughs> trip to India actually today. Oh yeah. Is, uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Modi, absolutely. Which is going to India? Yes. Yes. What's, yes. What's, okay. what's, what's he going there to get? Like a sari or well, something? Well, right. What he's going to there to do? He's got two reasons to go. Firstly, um, this is a point which again I perhaps should say we have a political crisis in Britain. Um, we're having a cost of livings crisis. The economy is going to pieces. Um, uh, the Conservative Party has now turned on Boris Johnson. Um, there's there's an absolutely ridiculous scandal here about the fact that he had parties in the uh, gardens of 10 Downing Street. And they weren't really parties. They were sort of social gatherings in the gardens of 10 Downing Street during the pandemic lockdowns, which broke the law. But, you know, it's not, I think, people's major concern at the moment. But the important thing was there was a debate in the House of Commons. It became very clear that the Conservative Parliamentary Party was not supporting Johnson and supported the opposition's call for a further investigation into whether or not Johnson misled Parliament about this. If, by the way, the investigation decides... <laughs> Sorry, apologies. Uh, um, that he did mislead Parliament. I mean, he's over. I mean, he's he's gone. He he won't be able to remain Prime Minister. That's my assessment, anyway. So he is in very very serious political difficulties indeed. And I think this particular event has been um, brought up because again the political system senses that he's overcommitted Britain to this policy over Ukraine. And I don't think there's going to any, be any change in the policy, but I think that they want to basically have him as the fall guy for it. So he's gone to India because, you know, it's a big country. It's uh, um, the Conservative Party has been trying to get the support of the Indian community in Britain. There are various Indian uh, um, people, people of Indian extraction in the government, uh, uh, Rishi Sunak, our finance minister, uh, Syed Javid, who is our health secretary. Um, so he's going to India partly for that reason, partly for domestic political reasons. The other is India is the rising power. We want to uh, develop economic and trade relations with India. Importantly, before going to India, he said that he would not lecture India over Ukraine and Russia. So I'm assuming... He, that he said Indian that explicitly? He said that explicitly. So I, I assume that what happened is that the Indian government made it very clear to the British government that if Johnson was coming to India, trying to persuade the Indians to change their policy, then he would not be welcome in India, and they would call the trip off. Yeah, I think that um, I've never really respected Boris Johnson. He, yeah. he seemed more like a buffoon than yeah. than a real leader. Uh, I don't have a problem with uh, you know doing the populist gest uh, gesture. Um, I, I remember once, I think for the Olympics, as mayor of London, he had himself uh, helicoptered in or something like that, waving a little. Mm. Uh, I thought that was amusing. I, 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 many people thought that, oh, it's beneath the dignity of the office. But I don't have a problem with a politician, you know, yeah. mixing it up and, and, and acting, uh, playing a bit of the buffoon. And also many times yeah. some of the smartest people you'll ever meet go around yeah. the world pretending to be buffoons so that nobody yeah. realizes how truly clever they are. Yes. Uh, but my, my thinking about uh, Boris Johnson is that he's an incredibly disorganized man who has no follow through. He, yes. he will, you know, it's a, always a, a flash in the pan, but, you know, no, um, no steak or, or, you know, I don't know how to continue the metaphor, but you know what I'm saying. And so yes. uh, the fact that he's going to uh, India, what exactly is the point? Except nothing. Mm -hmm. no. uh, the Indians have already made it clear that they are not going to play ball with the Western sanction regime against Russia right. because... Yeah. Because of longstanding ties with Russia, I, let me phrase it. First of all, there's the obvious economic interest of the, yes. of the Indians vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. Secondly, um, the, the, um, the, there is a longstanding psychological issue between the political class in India and Russia, which has always supported them. 
uh, through thick and thin, especially with their dealings with India's dealings with Pakistan, which is the erstwhile American ally. The Mm -hmm. Russians have always been with the Indians and they've always tried to smooth things over between the Indians and the Chinese. So the the Mm -hmm. Indian political class has a lot of good feeling for Russia and they're not going to antagonize it for no reason. And, and they also realize the Indian leadership realizes that if, if they if they fold in so far as Western mm. pressure, they, they're going to be next. And so it's better to take the hit now than later, and and mm. make it clear to your friends, i.e. the Russians, that you are going to stand with them. And so when mm. things get rough for the Indians, they're going to be hoping yeah. that the Russians stand with them, and the Russians will. And so you know I, I think that the Indian issue is over. And the yeah. only thing that we should be waiting for insofar as India is for them to come to a settlement with the Chinese over the water rights issues in the Himalayas. Yeah. That's a yeah. big issue. Because for those of you who don't know, the Chinese in the Himalayas in their territory have diverted some of the water flow uh, from the Himalayas to, uh, to hydroelectric dams that are very beneficial to the Chinese, but of course, hurts the Indians because it dams up that water flow that the Indians need for agriculture in the north of India, which is heavily populated. And so they are very nervous about that. And that has caused a great deal of tension between China and India. And I suspect this is a speculation on my part, but I suspect that seeing how things are playing out, the Chinese will play it smart and realize that they're going to negotiate with the Indians and they are going to cede on a lot of issues so as to cement a strong relationship with India, just as the Chinese ceded on a lot of issues uh, with Russia back in the 90s when they were when they were having the border dispute issues, and Russia at that time was you know, figuratively on its back and did not really have much muscle, and the Chinese, instead of taking advantage of this, played the long game, gave up some of their aspirations uh, insofar as uh, territory, which they ceded to the Russians, but which those those um, th- those sacrifices that they made back in the 90s have paid off huge today. The Chinese know how to play the long game, and so I suspect they'll do the same with the Indians. And so th- this tripartite alliance between India, China, and Russia, I think it's it's in the process of development. And if the British uh, prime minister thinks that he's going to go there and actually affect that development, he's a fool. And if it will do anything other than postpone the inevitable for his government, you know, he's a fool. Yeah, that, that's my thinking on that issue. Hello? Yeah, I'm with you. I think Alexander's muted. Yeah, muted. Oh, okay. yes, yeah, I, there was one other thing which I remember, which is these fires in the... The fires, yeah, I think that's the last topic, yeah, in, the fires. In, 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 in Tver, um, um, there's... What there's fires, been, I'm uh, sorry? Right, so there's a, there was a, a, a military scientific uh, center in Tver, which, uh, which is in Russia, obviously, it's in central Russia, uh, which caught fire, and some people were burnt there, and uh, there, there was some damage done, and some people were injured. And it's an important for scientific establishment. And there is also a big factory there which produces nitrates, which are, of course, important for rocket engines. And there was a fire there as well, it seems. Now, I have to say the Russians are saying incredibly little about this, but it was a big story in some parts of the media, particularly on Zero Hedge, I noticed. Um, I, I think the subtext to some of these stories is that these particular um fires may have been the may have been the work of saboteur saboteurs ukrainian saboteurs it's possible i don't know i don't think it will make any significant difference to the war until i we know more about you know, what these fires were all about you know i think it's difficult to come to any kind of conclusions the I, Russian I, media I, uh, has not barely barely registered the story I, I have something to add to that is i understand it i could be wrong but nitrates are essential as a fertilizing agent right fertilizing well yeah absolutely yes. yeah, yeah so absolutely. You, you know it, it look sometimes uh, you know a cigar is just a cigar as they say yes yeah you know this is genuinely just an accident it could also be we, we should always remember that many times a cover-up is not because of some nefarious plot yeah. going on, yeah. but just to cover up embarrassment. 
and, and incompetence. That happens yes. all the time. And, and so it could very well be that uh, whoever is trying yeah. to keep a lid on this because, yeah. you know, it's just a stupid, uh, a stupid incompetence and, and it doesn't mean anything, no sabotage, nothing. But of course, mm -hmm. the, the cover up sometimes causes a lot more attention to be drawn to something that is fundamentally trivial. But it, unless yeah. it has an actual impact on the war effort I, I, it, or an actual impact on yes. fertilizer production, I, I don't see much of a... I don't see much of a story to tell you the truth. An industrial no. accident, you know, but yes. that's, yes. that's yes. based on the information you've given me because I have no idea. Yes. About this stuff. Well, exactly. And in fact, we've had very little real information. Mm -hmm. As I said, I, I, I have to say industrial accidents like this happen all the time. We're less used to them in Britain than we used to be because to be straightforward about it, we don't have these giant factories in Britain anymore. But, you know, if you did once upon a time, you would if you know, I, I can remember they were not that uncommon. So I, I wouldn't place too much weight on this story. What I would say is, you know, if the Ukrainians did manage a sabotage operation there, well, you know, they're good at that sort of thing. I mean, you know, and I think that the Ukrainians have shown in the past that they do have. You know, very committed people who are How prepared to carry out these kind of operations. Tver is, uh, Tver is, Tver is, Tver is not. It's it's, it's close to Moscow. Central Russia. It's close, close to, to Moscow. Moscow. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I don't think it was sabotage. I, yeah. I think the Ukrainians would try to sabotage something a lot closer, something that would actually yeah. affect the military performance yeah. of the Russians, something that far away yeah. and obscure. I, it just doesn't. I mean, I, yeah, I could be. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm trying doesn't... to agree, actually. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it makes sense, for instance, those very, very daring helicopter pilots who, who flew yeah. to Belgorod and, and blew up those uh, uh, oil depots that turned out to be civilian yeah. oil depots, but they didn't know, or, or whatever. Uh, you know, brave, and, and it made sense militarily. Yes. Some um, nitrate factory close to Moscow? I don't yeah. know. It, it just... I, I, I agree with that. I have By the way, has, has Biden that. done any more gaps? Has he has he acted like a bigger <laughs> idiot than usual? So it's I like, did. It's hard, I, it's hard I to keep up. I, I don't know whether you caught the the, the 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 very weird thing where he was shaking air. He was, sh he was his hand was shaking. What? An invisible person. Yes, Alex, do you want to do you want to describe this? Your bedroom. Yeah, it's. Done. I mean, how how can you describe <laughs> it? He was giving a he was giving a speech. Um, right. And when he finished his yeah. speech, he turned to his to his right side. Mm -hmm. And yeah. he just put his hand out as if he's going to shake someone's hand, but there was no one there. And he just sat there for like 10 oh. seconds. And <laughs> then he kind of wandered a little bit to the back of the podium. He didn't know where to go. And then they kind of directed him off the, off the stage. Wait, it was just nobody else there on stage? No, he, he was in front There's of the podium. Else? Yeah, giving his speech. He finishes his speech. What was behind him? Was there more people or, or what? No, it was just like your typical backdrop. It was like a like, like a typical like a, like a poster, like a banner thing in the backdrop okay. and a couple of people, you know, placed in the back area. But there was no one on mm -hmm. stage with him. He was by himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he just turns to, to his right side and or his left side, whatever, and puts his hand out. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. Oh man! That's, yeah, that's like so like I don't know if you can see me now, Gonzalo. That's he just sad. kind of turns and put his hand puts his hand there, and you know, that's, that's sad. There. And it just lingered I mean, for like five, ten seconds, like his yes, hand was just yes, sitting yes. there. Look, I, I always thought that uh, weird. the first time I, I noticed Joe Biden was during the uh, Anita Hill Clarence Thomas hearings uh, back in ninety ninety one. I thought he was just the most disgusting person imaginable. He just seemed like such a corrupt politician. Just looking at him. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I never gave him another thought. But now to see him like this, um, I, I still despise him as a politician, but y you have to feel sorry for him as a human being because we are all going to be like that eventually. I mean, if we're lucky enough to live to old age, we are all going to be, you know, a, 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 a shadow of what we once were. And, and and to be paraded around and humiliated like this, mm -hmm. I I I hope I don't live to see that because I mean th that that's just sad that, that to be paraded like that. Oh, man. well, you see, he that, said that, he's going to run for a second term as well. That's that's kind of news. 
he's not go- he's going to resign uh yeah. look my thinking is uh january 21st 2023 any date after that his his days are numbered they're they're waiting around because they have this bizarre notion that they can elect kamala harris twice not once twice and they want to get the full 10 years out of her um because as you know I, I, I forget which amendment it was, the 26th, I want to, but I forgot, uh, that the um, the president can only run for two consecutive terms, uh, but he can wind up serving 10 years in total if he, if, if, um, if he replaces a former president and, and serves out one day less than two years, one day less than half the term. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, yeah but, you know, Kamala Harris is going to be the next president which I, I find shocking. I, mm. I, it's just inconceivable. And I do believe it's going to happen as a result of the catastrophic November 2022 midterms. Mm. And I have to be, you know, you two gentlemen are, are, are always so measured, always so thoughtful. And I'm the loose cannon here. So I'll be the one who says it. I just believe that the Democratic Party and the institutionalized Democrats in the deep state regime are going to figure out a way to cheat in a lot of those House and Senate seats. Mm -hmm. And what should be clearly a supermajority for the Republican Party, they are going to somehow figure out a way to steal it. Uh, Mm -hmm. I know that that's tinfoil hat territory, but I've got to say it. And chat, if you believe I'm I'm, I'm speaking the truth, hit plus one, you know? you know, I, because if if and if you think I'm a, I'm just crazy, hit zero. But that's what I truly think that they're going to figure out a way to do it because these people are so corrupt that they mm. are going to figure it out. You know what I mean? I mean, they did it mm. in 2020. Let, let's let's come on. It cannot be that Joe Biden got more votes than Barack Obama. It's just not possible. Okay, it, mm. it's just not in this reality. Okay. So anyway, that's what I think. Oh, a lot of chat seems to agree with me. Yeah, there's a plus one. I see one zero and a lot of plus ones. <laughs> plus one, plus, plus one. Do you, do you guys do you guys want to uh, try the video for like a few seconds? Which video? Video, so people can do you want, do you want to see if uh, it holds up for like a minute or so. For this. Oh, okay, well, uh, I'm, I'm, well, I'm I'm happy. Here I don't I don't I know if it'll hold up. Oh, we lost Gazala. We had him for like a second. Second. Okay. Well, I, I'll put it yeah, up. There we go. It doesn't hold up. Yeah. It, it doesn't, doesn't hold up. up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, t- tell me more because, you know, to t- like I said before, you know, talking about uh, foreign affairs and politics and yeah. all this, this is just yeah. like, oh, it's such a mental relief. Because mm. talking about your own problems and whining about them is just so sad. You know, I'm, mm. I'm, I don't want to be that guy ever. Uh, mm. and so, yeah, let's talk about. Um, yeah. By the way, if, if Boris Johnson, Alexander, if Boris Johnson is on the way out, um, <laughs> who are the, um, the, the, the conservatives putting up? That that is an excellent question because at the moment they're short of people because the yeah. person that they'd been uh, uh, who had been built up last year as the person who would take over was Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor. Right. Uh, yeah. His he, reputation he's, he's yeah. collapsed. His reputation has imploded over the last few weeks. His uh, uh, wife, who is a immensely rich, was caught in a tax scandal, um, mm. and, and that's damaged him. And he's now being increasingly criticized for the problems in the economy. So he doesn't look like he's going to be the next prime minister at all. So Mm. we are left with the two stars of the British cabinet, the scintillating political uh, colossi, who are Liz Truss and Ben Wallace. (laughs) I really am not making that up. I I really am not making that up. I I, I look up at the sky to see these giant... Colossi, yeah. as you call them correctly, yeah. strolling across the globe, yeah. you know, with you know, yeah. furrowed brow, knowing exactly what they are going to do to make the yeah. world a better place for all of humanity. Oh my God! Yeah, oh my God. I, I, I have, I have to say, I, I, I do wonder whether the ultimate objective in much of this is to create some kind of mechanism 
to make the Labour leader Keir Starmer prime minister. In other words, get Johnson <laughs> out of the way, disorganise the Conservatives, maybe try to set up some kind of coalition government or uh, arrange an early election or something like that to make Keir Starmer prime minister in the sense that he is conceived as extremely reliable politically. I mean, he would continue the same policies, but that he doesn't offend people in quite the way that Boris Johnson does. And you can, anyway, blame everything that went wrong on Johnson. So I, I do wonder Michael whether Gold? that is a long-term agenda. Sorry? What happened what to happened Michael Gold? Michael oh, Gold. he's still around. He's still around, lying very low. Perhaps, uh, perhaps you must wait, you know, perhaps you'll come out fighting or roaring if things do turn out the way we said. But at the moment, he... There isn't very much interest in him. The other person who I, I find very interesting is um, Kwasi Kwarteng, who was the business secretary, who last year seemed to be rising, a rising figure in the Conservative Party. Well, he's almost completely disappeared from the media to an, ex to a, to an extraordinary degree. And again, I don't know why. Maybe he's seen as unreliable in this crisis. But... Um, I would have expected that with Sunak out of the way, Kwarteng would be the person. But you know, but no, he doesn't seem to be you in know, the running I, I at all. The, I get the vibe and that uh, mm. some of the smarter members of the British Parliament, uh, you yeah. know, some of the, the 1922 committee members, yeah. some of the yeah. backbenchers, that that are very they're quality people. Um, yeah. I think that oh, they, yeah. they might. Be, they, I mean, I, I'm thinking like the, the famous one is Jacob Rees-Mogg, but. There's a yeah. deep bench there. And I suspect that a lot of them um, are, uh, they're, they're realizing that over the next couple of years, there's going to be so much of a crisis that it's better not to stick your head out yet. Let the crisis play out. Let the Labour uh, Party have a, have a go at the disaster. And then, um, you know, uh, when, when that nightmare of the Labour Party government happens only then come out and strike and and try to pick up the pieces you know to i think that how can i put it see we yeah. three and and your audience we sort of see that there's this big disaster brewing uh economically mm. politically that the whole old paradigm mm. is collapsing and mm. and we see it and and quite frankly none of us three and 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 chat included we're not that bright we, we kind of like figure mm. it out what's going on right and so yeah. maybe some of the really smart people in the British government are pretty much on the same page and they're figuring, you know, yes. maybe let it play out first before making a move. You see what I'm saying? Yes. And go be one of those people who realizes it's going to be such a nightmare over the next three to five years that maybe it's better to just lie low. Mm -hmm. And when when everything is just, you know, so like at, at the nadir, only then come in like on the white horse to save the day. You mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Absolutely. No, I think you may very well be right. Um, I should add that there's also the first indicators of a political crisis in Germany, and um, there's talk there's there's talk that there's now moves in Germany to get Schultz out of the way. Now the reason you, is you, the we hardly knew you. What, what, they're going to yeah. get rid of Schultz now. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, the the reason, believe it or not, is because he's not being hard hard line enough on the Russians that he's not what? shipping leopard tanks and uh, other things uh, uh, to Ukraine. That's, that's, that's the thing that's been spreading around. But, of course, the fact is Germany is heading into a major economic crisis. Bear in mind the German media is, pr is deeply Atlanticist. It may be the most Atlanticist media in the world, actually. I mean, if you think the British and American media are one, you know, mono uh, mono voiced you know, one one line. The German media, in my experience, is even more so in many respects. So, you know, it's, it's the Atlanticists who are making the running in Germany. But um, I, I think what's happening is that Scholz, who I think is frankly rather dim, is finding that trying to appease all sides is failing. He went along with sanctions packages, which he once said that he would never do. And I think he's found that he's now, uh, you, that you can't appease these, these demands, that always these demands escalate. So the, the, the hardliners see him as soft, whereas 
those forces within Germany who would have supported a chancellor who drew a strong line and said, you know, we're not prepared to take these steps because they're going to jeopardize Germany's future. In other words, German industry and German trade unions, uh, they, they have lost trust and confidence in him. So he's looking very exposed and he seems to have alienated all the various big blocks within Germany as well. So I, it's possible we could see a, a, a change of government in Germany. I've always thought that this particular government that was patched together after the German election was not going to survive for very long. I, I would say that if Scholz falls and if we get a hardliner taking over, I doubt that will be sustainable for very long either. Hello? I hear you. Gonzalo's muted. Gonzalo's muted. Gonzalo's Sorry, I just have to mute uh, just briefly. I just yeah. continue. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that, that, that's all I wanted to say. So a crisis, political crisis in Germany, a political crisis in Britain, a sense in the United States that just, I, you know, I, I heard all that you said about the midterms, but there's still widespread universal expectations that the Democrats are going to go crashing in the midterms. Worries in the United States about some of the investigations that are taking place there. I mean, there's the laptop gate investigation, which is underway. Durham has been making big moves in the United States. And there's been all kinds of court filings, which have been very interesting and which point clearly to people at the very top of the Clinton campaign being essentially behind the creation of Russia Gate, and we've got to talk now about the creation of Russia Gate because did, did, uh, did Durham make any moves? Did something happen on that? Yes, side? yes. Well, there's there's a uh, trial of uh, Michael Sussman, this uh, Perkins Coy lawyer, coming up, and he's been making various filings and also demands for discovery. And uh, there's all sorts of documents and papers that he's looking for. But essentially, what, what they all seem to point to is that Russiagate was launched not in June or July 2016, as we all thought, but perhaps even in April, and that every element in it seems to have been put together with the purpose of painting Donald Trump as connected to the Russians. Now, it's a very complicated and long story. Um, I made copious notes, which I haven't yet read properly through, but which I'm thinking that we should perhaps do a program about at some point. But it, it really does all look extremely sinister, very bad for the Clintons, but also ultimately very bad for the administration as well. So, it, you know, you, got, you, you get bad news in the midterms, a very panicked speech by Elizabeth Warren, who seemed to be laying some of the blame on Nancy Pelosi and seem to be saying, you know, that we mustn't look as if we're involved in financial investment, trading and that kind of thing, which was clearly referring to Pelosi, as far as I could see. And um, yeah, yeah. so a, pa a panic statement from Elizabeth Warren, uh, very, very I'm disturbing sorry. investigations How much the way. How much traction did this get? I mean, I mean, let me get this straight. Um, Elizabeth Warren publicly said that uh, she Congress did, people she, should not be. Yeah, pretty much. She didn't mention Pelosi by name. She, uh, when she said, I think she didn't say Congress people. She said we, people, you know, we. In other words, people in Congress. But it mm -hmm. was it was coded. It was coded thinly coded language. But to answer your question, it didn't get vast amount of traction. It didn't get published very widely because, of course, the media isn't going to, uh, uh, um, you know, flag up these questions just as it's not giving a huge amount of weight to what Durham is doing or what indeed um, is going on with Laptop Gate. They're, they're, they're not really reporting these stories. But if the Democrats crash in the midterms and the Republicans gain big majorities in the House and perhaps a working majority in the Senate, then it's possible that all of these investigations could be activated in an even more serious way. And then, of course, things could turn 
take a, take very dramatic turns. Jesus, Jesus. Mm. So okay. crises, um, political crises, instability in Britain, Germany, and the United States, the three most important countries in the West, and a bitterly contested election in France. And I should say, by the way, that everybody I've spoken to about the situation in France is in agreement that even if Macron wins, which is still, frankly, the overwhelmingly high probability, there will be more political um, instability in France before very long. more yellow vest protests and that sort of thing we hear you alexander um oh yeah okay yeah so um we covered a lot of ground we have covered uh, a lot he, of ground how, how are you holding Go up gonzalo should we wrap it up i yes yeah did, did you mind terribly um because no, i do no, I have to up. talk to you guys no, about I, 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 things and so Yes. Uh, also, yeah. also, but, um, also, 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 I, 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 oh, go ahead, Alexander. I, I have commitments, but I wanted to say to Gonzalo that it has been a massive pleasure, a huge relief to be able to do a live stream with you again. I Me mean, too. You know, I, I enjoy a live stream, but you know, um, you know, to be able to do it again after these rather stressful days, stressful for us. I'm not even going to try and guess how stressful for you. Um, we mustn't pray not, too much. But, you know, it's, it's been a huge pleasure and a huge relief mm -hmm. and a joy, in fact. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you right. very much. And I just want to say to uh, Janat uh, that thank you so much for your support. As I, as I said earlier, um, it, it's, it's deeply humbling. And I thank you so much. But, um, you know, I... I I don't know how things are going to play out, but I'm I'm thinking that probably things will be for the best. And so I think that the mm -hmm. emphasis should be uh, on people who are, are still in limbo, people who are still gone. Those are the people mm -hmm. that you should be focused on. I mentioned to you guys that mm -hmm. I have a new Twitter account. Um, it's it's Gonzalo Lira 1968, uh, mm -hmm. and on that Twitter. Those people whom you should check out, and some mm. of them are still, some of them have died, and some of them are still with us. And the ones who are still with us, we should support them because their plight is no different from my own. I was just fortunate enough that I have a, a, a couple of, uh, of uh, foreign passports and uh, support of literally hundreds of thousands of people that I thank so much. But those mm. are the people who are still in trouble, those are the people that we should be supporting. And so I thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, that's that's all I have to say. All right. Uh, let's thank you, everybody. Thank you to our moderators. Uh, thank you for, for taking care of this chat. And uh, we'll, we'll sign off for, for today. I, I hear a lot of sirens in the background as well. So let's let's sign it off. Yeah, thank I'm you, sorry everybody. about that. It's, it's no, no worries. Yeah. Well, OK, bye. Let's, yeah, bye bye. Bye bye.